Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Worship of Kaiser Christian Church. Welcome to everyone joining us from home. Let's begin our time of worship with music. me in the call to worship. Holy, 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 holy God is here. Holy, 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 love has called us here. Holy, 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 gather to worship our holy God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we come this day into this sacred moment and this sacred space, aware that your holiness is always around us. As Moses before us, when we turn aside from our daily tasks and we listen for your holy voice, speak to us, holy mystery. Surround us with your wondrous love that we might be wise enough to understand your call and be brave enough to follow your path. Amen. This world can be
around and see that it's you, that it's you that we need. Start a fire in me. You are the fire, you are the flame, you are the light on the darkest day. We have the hope, we bear your name, we carry the So there's no doubt or denying Let it burn so brightly That everyone around can see That it's you, that it's you that we need Start a fire in me You are the fire, you are the flame You are the light on the darkest day blessing it is to be with you in worship this morning as we come into the time in our praise of God together where we lift up our blessings and our concerns. We had a chance as you came in to fill out a blessing and concern card. So we'll get those on our weekly email to the congregation so that we can be joining you in your sharing of blessing and also your prayers, and concerns. Join with me now as we lift up our joys and concerns to God. Holy and ever-present God, we come before you this morning in praise and thanksgiving, bearing the burdens of our hearts and the joys as well. God, you call yourself, I am who I am. You are sometimes a great mystery, and yet also an ever-present comfort. Lord, we lift up today joys and thanksgivings for new life, the blessings of continuing generations, the beauty of a newborn's face. We pray for parents and grandparents, we lift up prayers for those who struggle with health concerns today, Lord. Wrap your healing arms around them. Lord, we see the pain and suffering in our world through natural disaster, fires, political strife and protest. We ask the force of your calming and peaceful spirit in all these places. Regardless of where we stand on one issue or another, God. We ask your presence in each of these places with all of these people. May your hand of peace guide us 
now and into the future. For we remember what your Son came into this world to teach us. Follow the way of Jesus, the way of grace and of love. Help that way be ever present in our minds this morning and always. As we continue in worship, praying the way that he taught us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. share a blessing for our young ones this morning. Holy God, this morning we have a particular reason to ask your blessing on new life in our midst. The newborns of the people of this congregation, we ask your hand of blessing upon them and their parents and their grandparents and at the same time, they wonder at this new little person in their lives, considering all the hopes and dreams that they have for them. 
also wondering, how are we going to do this? Lord, we ask that you wrap each family in your loving arms, each child comforted and blessed by your spirit. We all have things in our life that we just expect to work, don't we? Things you don't necessarily think too much about. You just have unerring confidence that each day you pick this thing up or turn this thing on, it will function as it is meant to function. You trust it. Right? You don't expect it to act in strange or abnormal ways. Right? We all have these things. This morning I had an experience where the expected function of something that I owned did not happen. And, and as you all chuckle and think about times that's happened to you, you have a, a thought in your head about, oh, I know that. It's kind of funny, later, usually. This morning as I was getting ready for church, dressed in my suit, about to walk out the door, little Henry is switching from chasing the cat to chasing my feet, and I can't resist the desire to bend down and pick him up and give him one last squeeze before I go. And that's when it happened. The suit that I have dragged across continents and worn in myriad places, trusted to fulfill its duty, failed me. You all know what happened. I bent down to pick up this lovely child. I heard the <laughs> of a failed scene. Kim looks at me and she's like, was that your knees or the pants? And I said, I think you know. And so by the grace of God, I am still with you fully clothed this morning, scrambled and found some long-buried extra pair of slides. And I tell that story because something not completely dissimilar happens to Moses in Scripture passage today. Something that he walks by every day just expecting it to do its normal thing. All of a sudden is being very abnormal. This bush that he probably walked by hundreds of times on his way to care for the flocks all of a sudden bursts into flames. A story from Exodus chapter 3 goes like this. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led his flocks beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. When Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, but I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, 
Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent you me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. This is a familiar story for us, isn't it? The beginning, the story of Israel's exodus out of Egypt into the desert, wandering for decades, literally generations of people. It's interesting to note that this place, Horeb, that Moses is going out to with the flocks beyond the wilderness. You may wonder, what is beyond the wilderness? In some places, the, the name Horeb is, used, is described as the wasteland. This is where God meets Moses. The wasteland. The same Mount Horeb in other places in Scripture is described as Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Moses witnesses this burning yet unburnt bush, which often in our reading of the story steals our attention. We get consumed by this idea of the same as Moses, like, I must investigate what, why is this bush burning? Why is it unburnt? What a mystery or power of God is happening here. And we as readers, we read back and look at this story and we wonder what, what great symbolism must there be in the figure of this burning bush. And I encourage you, don't overthink the bush. That's not the point of the story. Just as it steals our attention now, it stole Moses' attention. But if we notice from the point that God speaks, Moses isn't paying attention to the bush anymore. It's a simple tool for God to get Moses' attention. Sometimes the same thing happens to us, doesn't it? The thing that God uses to get our attention, we become consumed with curiosity over that thing, and we miss what God may be pointing us to. So forget the bush. Remember the other characters in this story. There's an angel messenger that shows himself briefly before the voice of God makes itself known. Moses is there. This is God's first presence in the story of Exodus. And there are a few elements involved. There is that visible element of the bush and the messenger angel who appears from the flame, something that Moses actually sees. And there is the invisible, the voice of God. And all of a sudden, the bush and the angel, the visible aspects are forgotten.
from that voice of God, we get this formula for Israel's, or for God's interaction with Israel. God says, I have seen, I have heard, and I have known. There is a fourth action that God often employs with Israel. It is implied in verse 6 where God remembered. God sees, hears, knows, and remembers God's people. God acknowledges Israel's afflictions, their cries, their sufferings, as God does the same for all people. Now, it is true we are inheritors of this God-given identity as God's people. As followers of Jesus, God's own Son, we inherit that identity. Some things that are not true, though. It is not true that we are somehow unique in that identity as God's people. It is not true that we have somehow earned that identity and are uniquely blessed by God based on what we do or where we live or what we look like. It is not true that we always relate to the role of Israel in the biblical narrative. That's the one I want to talk about today. But isn't it true that we often, as we read Bible stories throughout the Old and New Testament, somewhat based on our shared identity as the people of God with the first people of God, the people of Israel, we tend to align ourselves with their role in the story oftentimes, don't we? We hear God's interaction with Israel and we're like, that's like us. We read the story and we want to be the oppressed people of Israel in the story because the only other obvious choice is that of the oppressor. We don't want to be that. Well, obviously, we must be playing the role of Israel in the narrative, right? We take any struggle that we have in life and we tend to shoehorn it into this Israel narrative, convinced that we share that position of the oppressed that God is going to rescue whenever and whoever it is that disagrees with us or stands in our way is automatically the Pharaoh of the story. But I want to challenge that assumption this morning and encourage us to really just let's be honest. The majority of our American population never experienced oppression on the kind of scale that we're talking about in the biblical narrative. Where someone or a group of someone's is actively working to keep them down or keep them subjugated. Does that ring true? Stay with me. So if we're not the oppressed of our own story, as we parallel ours with the story of Israel, if we're not the oppressed of our own story, we're not Israel. Who are we? Are we the Pharaoh? Yes or no? No? Okay. Those are our classic two choices, aren't they? You're either the oppressed or the oppressor. So then we must ask, what choices are left? 
Traditionally, we have only considered these two. What if we considered that we often find ourselves in the role of the Egyptian people? in this narrative, in our own narrative. True, they didn't get mentioned much. It, from this point on, it mostly focuses on the interaction between Pharaoh and Moses representing the Israelites. But we know they're there. In context, the Egyptians were complicit in the oppression of others because of the system they lived in kept the Israelites down and benefited the Egyptians. Now, just like the Israelites, these Egyptians were stuck in that system that was ultimately harmful to all of them involved. The difference was that the Egyptians had the ability to do something about it. So do we. They had the power to choose to accept the broken system. To continue to benefit from the oppression of others. Or they could use their power. The first step to that is not denying that you have any to begin with. Because you do. They did. They could use their power, their voice, to become allies of Israel and advocates for them. Now, again, we are not Israel in this story. We are the Egyptians. We have a choice to make, the same as they did. Now, our position is a bit easier than even theirs in this decision-making process because we follow the same God, the same God of Israel as the Israelites in our Exodus story this morning. The God that rescued Israel from physical oppression also rescues us Gentiles from the oppression of the mind and spirit. That lack of humility that we often experience and notions of superiority that infect our culture. God rescues us from that oppression. The same God that announced to Moses, I am who I am. Who instructs Moses to tell the people, I am has sent me to you. This is the same God that we've that we praise and worship each time we gather. And while this self-professed moniker, I am who I am, tells us little detail about who in fact God is, it does tell us a lot about our relationship to God in the unspoken message that follows, I am who I am, and you are who you are. As the scripture says, this is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. And so the question for us is who will we choose to be? Let us continue our worship this morning with enjoying the hymn of response, God of grace and God of glory.
I'm sure being a shepherd is a busy job. Sheep can be, can't be the easiest animals to tend, prone to wandering, off, vulnerable to attacks by predators. There's no doubt Moses had to stay vigilant in his work to ensure the safety and integrity of the flock. And yes, when he saw the burning bush, he said, I must turn aside. There is so much clamoring for our attention these days. Some things are essential, like jobs and family responsibilities. Others are empty distractions that captivate our attention. When God calls us to do, to turn aside, to see the presence of God with us, to step off the treadmill and step into God's holy ground. This time of offering is a time to turn aside from the demands of the world and answer the call of God to be generous servants. There is so much need around us, but too often we don't take the time to see it. By supporting God's work through the church, we're claiming our role as co-laborers for God's kingdom. Let us turn aside and acknowledge the God, God's generosity as we collect our offerings and tithes. Will you bow with me in prayer? Loving God, you have given us eyes to see the need around us and ears to hear the cries of our brothers and sisters. Break open our hearts so that we may keep, so that we may weep when you weep and remind us you have given us the spirit and the resources to turn mourning into rejoicing. Amen. As we consider that question, who will we be? We 
have a lot of resources to draw on to inform our answer. We know who God says God is. I am who I am. Emmanuel, God with you. Creator of heaven and earth and all that is in it. We know also what God has to say about who we are. God's beloved, God's created beings. We are also described as those people, all people, in fact, who are welcome and invited to this table, the place we come for spiritual renewal, reconnecting and remembering who God is and who we are, what better place to consider that question? Who will we be? Who will we be when we walk out that door tomorrow, the next day? Who will we be? I imagine the disciples wondering that for themselves Jesus extended that first invitation to the communion table. Who will we be when our teacher is not with us anymore? Who will we be after tomorrow when he sacrifices himself for us? Let us respond joyfully to that open invitation to commune with God. Lord God, you sent Moses in ancient times to free your people from slavery because you concerned yourself with their suffering. Then later, you, the great I am of old, sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to us, who himself became our savior, to free all people from their slavery to sin and death by his own death. As we take the crushed grape and the ground grain, these symbols of your death into our bodies today. Burn into our hearts the eternal truth that you are still the God who cares deeply about our misery and suffering. Help us to receive your freedom and rest and peace each day. In Jesus' name, amen. we approach and gather around the table this morning, let us remember that first time long ago when Jesus gathered with his disciples and he served them, taking the bread and blessing it and breaking it for them, telling them, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat it, you remember me. Remember that in the same way he took the cup and he gave thanks for it and he poured it out for them, telling them, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for forgiveness. As often as you drink it, you remember me. join together now with all of God's people in Holy Communion.
couple of reminders before we close with our benediction this morning. Uh, remember, uh, Bible study is starting up again on Thursday at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll be, uh, for those that want to gather in person, we'll be gathering in the fellowship hall where we can spread out a little more and we'll continue to uh, offer it uh, via Zoom conference, whether by phone call or you know, logging in on your device make that available for everybody. So there's a couple ways you can participate in the Bible study starting again on Thursday. Uh, this Wednesday we'll be gathering again in the evening at 6.30 uh, for our worship sing-along time out here. In the, hopefully the cool of the evening. I uh, encourage you to join us in that. Bring your own chairs. Uh, if you forget, we'll bring one out for you, I guess. But if you want to be extra comfortable, you might want to bring your own. And I invite you now to stand and join together in our benediction. God, go and be who God calls you to be.